All right. The third biggest challenge um, is this, unintentionality. I have this little cartoon to illustrate. It says, may you grow so old that you unintentionally frighten small children. <laughs> unintentionality, which is basically um, what it sounds like. When you don't intentionally engage racialization and, uh, and ethnic borders, all right? Because what happens when you don't intentionally engage it is the lifeblood of any institution is its policies and its practices and procedures. And those things will reflect ethnic borders and racialization unless you examine them for those things and, and make changes. Let me tell you how this plays out. When I was at Cincinnati Christian University, uh, they brought me on and they said, one of the main things we want to do is we want to <coughs> diversify the faculty. I said, okay, well, let's get at it. Let's do it, right? So I uh, began to do my investigative work and I went to the powers that be and I said, it's going to be nearly impossible to diversify this place because there's one bylaw that's in here that is unintentionally hindering all of our efforts. I said, well, what is that? I said, well, it's the bylaw that says that you cannot work here full time unless you are a member of the Church of Christ. I don't know if y'all have that bylaw, but it was there. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, okay, so let's, let's look at this thing. Okay, say you have an opening in the English department. Okay, Alvin, go find some candidates. Okay, so let me get this straight. I got to find somebody who's got a doctorate in English. Okay, and then, I, then not only do they have to have a doctorate in English, they have to be a member of the Church of Christ. So my fishing pool has become a puddle, <laughs> that particular <laughs> thing, right? And then not only do they have to be a member of the Church of Christ, say if they're not in Cincinnati, they got to be willing to uproot their family and move and do all that stuff and move to Cincinnati on a Bible college professor's salary. And, and how, how's that go? You know, we're going to do all that. Makes the job exponentially harder. So now... The good founders of my alma mater, when they were putting those together, were they saying, yeah, we want to make sure this place never diversifies. Put that in there. <laughs> no. But they did not account for racialization. They did not account for ethnic borders. I understand what they were trying to do. It was the fundamentalist, modernist controversies back then, and they were trying to guarantee that the school stayed true to its conservative biblical roots, and they just made an assumption that, well, if you're, if you're Church of Christ, you know, uh, you will be biblical. So I said, so let me get this straight. If, I'm a, a, if I got a Ph.D. in English, and I'm a member of the Disciples of Christ Church, I'm eligible for this pool, but if all my theology is like you all's, and I happen to pastor a Baptist church, I'm not eligible for this pool? But that's what happens. And I said, I said, you can forget diversity until you all do something with the bylaws. Oh, we don't know if we can do that. So, well, <laughs> cancel Christmas, because I don't know if we're going to diversify this place. <laughs> But God in his providence, we found the first and second African-American professor in the history of the school, a, a, a couple by the name of John and Lachelle Edmerson, who came from the Churches of Christ, non-instrumental. We just fell into that. It wasn't, God's just like here, right? Because <laughs> we weren't going to find them. They just dropped in. But we also did some, um, some creative things. Like, uh, you know, we, we, we gave some, we had, a, we had an African-American man by the name of Chris Battle, and he taught like 10 to 12 hours. 
gave him a number. He was just short of, whatever it was, he was just short of being uh, full-time faculty. And, and we had a lot of adjuncts that we hired around to give the, the faculty some flavor, okay? Because we could, I mean, and here's the reality, too, when you enter into these things. Every institution has golden cows, and, and, and some things did not going to die on your watch. You know, it's just, that wasn't going to change. You know, so Christmas is back on, so you got to figure something out. That was not going to change, so we had to get creative, and we had to figure some things out. And actually, I think that... Uh, you know, this, is, this was 2004, it's like 2014, because of the, the campus has changed, diversif diversified, and, and they've had some professors of color record on there to the other. I heard a rumor that the Board of Trustees is actually going to discuss that. It's 10 years later, though, right? But I guarantee, I don't even have to look at Ozark. I know there's policies, practices, and procedures that are here that are stuck in ethnic <laughs> borders, and they're stuck in racialization that's going to have to change in order for this place to become more diverse because that's just the way things happen and that's the way things go. So um, we're going to skip the question time because we're out of time. We're, so uh, let me tell you about the typical Christian organization and we're going to move into thoughts about how to address these challenges. Typical Christian church, and I, and I extrapolate organization on this, is 10 times more segregated than the neighborhood that it's in. Okay, typically speaking, it's, it's, and this comes from Michael Emerson, a sociology professor at, at uh, Rice. Uh, 20 times more segregated than the public schools that it's in, typically speaking, not always. Uh, and leaders struggle on a personal level to integrate faith, their race, and leadership because of the three challenges that we talked about. All right? So I say that the way forward is, is transformative leadership, and I have a very simple uh, definition of transformative leadership is getting people to do what they won't naturally do. Because most leadership tasks, you don't have to do that. Most leadership tasks, I'm your boss, you need to do it. Or it's, um, it's, it's such a mundane task that it doesn't really require a whole lot of, you know, effort. But transformative leadership is leadership is, okay, here's where we need to go. There's a lot of barriers to keep people from going there. How do we maneuver people to get there without blowing the place up? <laughs> or you getting fired, <laughs> right? That's transformative leadership. It's an art, not a science. It's highly contextualized to particular situations. There's not, well, we did this. It might work here. It might not work here. So it's, it's, it's very, 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 um, like I said, artful in nature. Now, here's some realities of, of Christian institutions. There's processes and phases that institutions go through to get to become truly a multicultural place. All right? There's at least four, and there might be more, but I've identified at least four. Okay? And nobody goes from here to there overnight. This is typically a five to ten year, probably more ten year process. Okay? So the first phase is segregation, where the motivation to change is none, and the culture is homogeneous, meaning that, hey, we like everybody being the same ethnically and racially and probably social class-wise, and we're not going to do a whole lot to change that. And then the next phase is called assimilation. And a lot of times, the motivation is not theological, but it's legal or profit. And what I mean by profit is not necessarily financial, but there's something to be gained here. So for instance, you know, there's an institution who may call me and say, the millennials really care about social justice, so we want to have social justice as a main thing in our campus. And, and in, in order to do that, we've got to change ethnically, okay? Theology hasn't been cited at all. It's, we need quite frankly, more butts in the seats so our, so our dollars can go up and we see these demographic trends. We need something to happen here. And, and typically, the culture is one that's called multicolored. There's, there's different people of color, but the place, the culture of the place is still leaning or dominated by one particular group. And if you want to be part of that place, you've got to assimilate to the group norms. 
And this is what some people charge folk in saying, oh, tokenism. Okay? But here's the harsh reality. The first people of color who come into an institution such as this are going to be people who feel extremely comfortable in being in an all-white environment. I make them a token. It just means that they're very comfortable. And that's the people who will open the door for more. Because nobody is going to come here with the room sitting like this unless they're extremely comfortable with being in an all-white environment. That's just reality. And it could be vice versa. If it was all black folk and they wanted a white person, I'd say the same thing. The first people who come through these doors and our faculty and staff and all those types of things, they feel extremely comfortable in being in an assimilated environment. And, and so then after a while of walking that road, the next one is what the society that we live in strives for, and that's toleration. And when you enter the range of tolera tolera uh, toleration, now moral thoughts enter into, the mind, into our, our midst. Okay? It's not only legal or profit, but it's moral. In society nowadays, it is just wrong to be racist. It ain't always been like that, right? People, I mean, it's, it's just wrong. Many people can't tell you why, but they know it's wrong, right? And the whole deal is about toleration, being able to tolerate one another. And now the culture becomes mixed color. And they do things like my, my, my oldest daughter's high school, um, they have a black culture club. And at lunch, the black culture club, um, every now and then, like once a quarter, to raise money, they'll, they'll provide soul food for the students to come and to buy. Because, it, it, you know, and their line's like out the door for that. The white kids, the Latino kids, all those kids like that soul food. They like that stuff. So they line up. And, and they do, a, a, they do a, a very intentional job of making sure that all of this, they have trainings and seminars and, and service learning. They do all these things so that their students, is what they say, tolerate other ethnic and cultural groups. And we have a tendency to throw toleration under the bus. But I'm telling you, do not throw toleration under the bus because that's a good moral thing that people without the authority of scripture are trying to get to. Celebrate that. It's a good thing. But what we want to do is we want to get to reconciliation, where the motivation is theological, it's biblical. Why does Ozark do this? We hope your only answer is because of Matthew 22, 37 through 40. That's why we do it. We might have all these other byproducts. We might have more students of color. We might have all these things. But like that video, we do it because we want to prepare students from all nations to go forth and minister into whatever particular context they find themselves in. We do it whether it makes us money. We do it whether it costs us money. We do it. Is the CFO in the room? I'm sorry for saying that. But we do it <laughs> because of theology. That's what's to drive us. And it takes a while to get there. And that's when you truly have a true multi-ethnic culture within your organization. All right? So unless you, the, the only people who have a chance of starting off there are like a church plant. Like if you start off that way, you may never know any of these. But if you don't start off that way, you're going to be on one of these steps and you're going to have some time to have to move. And the only way you move is through intentionality, right? Because there's, um, this is adopted from a book called Diffusion of Innovations by Everett Rogers. It's been around forever. And anything you try to do in terms of a change process, because becoming a more multicultural institution is a change process, this is typically what you find, okay? You have people on the front end, that's about 3% out of 100, who are the innovators. That's the Travis's of the world. It, Travis don't care what y'all do, he gone, okay? <laughs> he gonna do what he gonna do. He don't give a rip. You know, administration get it, administration don't get it. Travis is always going to be doing something in this area, okay? And then you have a group called the early adopters, and that's about 13%, which I call advocates. And there are people who get it early on in terms of how all this fits together and how all this works, okay? 
And then you have this group, 34% called the middle adopters, and this is what we call the cautious group, because they're trying to figure this whole thing out. You know, the innovators, they're gone, they got it. The early adopters, they get it before some others. The middle adopters, it's going to take some time before they totally completely get this whole thing. And why are you changing the policies and the practices? Why are you offering this scholarship? Or why are you doing that? This group is very important because you know what this group does? This group makes sure these two groups don't drive the car off the cliff <laughs> and try to move way too fast. And this group's important too because it will be this group, the group that will eventually come on board, they will be convinced by this group. They are not going to be convinced by the Kool-Aid drinkers. <laughs> <laughs> what else? This group is going to say, what else are they going to say? This is all nice and fun and dandy, but yeah, whatever. Well, why are you doing it? Why are you getting on board? It's this group will be convinced by this group. And then there's the laggards, which are 16%, which is a traditionalist. And that's just the group, you know, God bless your heart, you just never go get it. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean you're negative and you're going to cause problems, you just don't get it. Okay? And there's always, in a change process, 16% of the people who just won't get it. Okay? Now, you need to honor the laggards and you need to honor the traditionalists as long as they're not acting crazy. Okay? Okay? You need to respect them. So this is sort of how reality happens and why it takes you 10 years to get from here to here, okay? So now, um, if you all were there this morning, these should look very familiar with you about how to communicate multi-ethnically because we talked about how this morning, how uh, when it comes to this, it's not about necessarily techniques, it's about who you are. You have to become a particular individual, and as you become that particular individual, that's how the ball moves down the field. So it's be Bible-based and spirit-empowered. That's, uh, that's self-explanatory. Uh, the practice humility that as you go down this road, that you become a learner, you become a spudge. To tell the truth, that means to have good, honest dialogue. Now see, we have had good, honest dialogue about race, and nobody has gotten mad. Nobody is, at least I don't know if anybody's gotten mad. <laughs> Nobody has flown off the handle. Does anybody feel disrespected? But we've had good, hard dialogue. Good, good dialogue. And that's where you want to be, all right? Patience. Um, there are folk who, let me go back to this real quickly. Sometimes people right here can be very hard on people who are here and here. Okay, I call them zealots. You know, they got it last week, and doggone it, how come you don't have it? And they just pound, pound, pound. When I got to the EFCA, there was, there was this white guy um, who was madder than me. I'm like, dude, you're not even black. They didn't even offend you. Why are you so mad? Why are you wanting to, to, to march and flip? I'm like, it's not that deep. No, no, no. It's like, okay, whatever, right? So <laughs> be patient with one another. Focus on the bright spots. This goes to our asset-based philosophy of finding what is working and doing more of it. Is the glass is half empty, the glass is half full, right? Is the glass half empty, meaning the stuff that you're not doing and you don't have, or is the glass half full, meaning that's the assets, that's the stuff that you do have? I say that's the wrong question. You should be asking, how do you fill the glass with more water? So how do you add more water, or how do you build upon the assets that you have? That needs to be where all the resources and the, the energy is put so that you can raise the water level. Because as you raise the water level, you will meet other needs. One of the, way, one of the reasons we had a, such a, a, a dynamic discussion at Cincinnati Christian University to uh, diversify the staff is because they started an, a uh, continuing education program and that program from day one was 50% non-white. And they began saying, wait a minute, why are all our professors white? 
And they asked all these other questions, and then people said, well, well, okay, well, I guess so. We need to figure this out. It's because they built upon that asset, and as they were, as they were resourcing that asset and it kept growing, and we started a program called Urban Scholars as well that, that had put students on campus, questions began to be asked that had never been asked before because critical mass had begun to be built. And then finally, show respect. That's self-explanatory. All right, um, we got nine minutes for trick or treat time for any questions <laughs> that you may want to ask. Questions they want to ask? Questions, concerns, comments that we haven't discussed or talked about? Yes, sir. What's your assessment as being on our campus with that tiered stage where we're at? Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've been here long enough to, to make that type of call. To the truth. You said the tape is running. It's always running. So what's your That's the tape. That is what's what's your tape? <laughs>
Well, that's great, but if you have to add these dudes of color of any significance on campus, and all of a sudden you drop a ton there, and then you're shocked when there's fireworks? Everybody has to be prepared. This has to be ramped up. The, the environment has to be prepared. Faculty and staff have to be prepared. The students have to be prepared about what they're going into. This has to be, you know, done very consciously. Right? Yes? What you just said, if you'd been in a discussion with me and a retired teacher from this institution mm -hmm. who said, why should we care what color a man is. Why don't we just hire the best man with a position? Why look for a black man? You can do that. Y'all been doing it. <laughs> you do it because of the opening video that I showed you. If you're going to create an, I mean, part of college is the students should be engaged in what the real world is. And this is not the real world. This is not where they're going to be ministering. I mean, they're, they're not going to, this is not the real world. So, to increase your chances of creating a real world laboratory so people can learn from one another, you need to be intentional in practicing diversity for the kingdom's sake. Because you want to prepare <coughs> students to be able to minister out in the real world. So that's why this place needs to become more diverse, so that the kingdom can go forward. That's that would be that's what I would say. Yes? From your perspective. Going from a mostly all white culture to one that is multicolored, what would be some of the primary issues that just kind of come with that transition as we would have more people of color on our campus, just as you've looked at that? The primary issue I sum up this way is that your consciousness begins to change about what's reality and what isn't reality in terms of worldview and life experiences. That's why a big thing is when you get students of color on your campus, they're going to create different, um, they're going to give different perspectives that haven't been considered before. And then it's, it's called managing the dynamics of difference. When those things pop up, how do you engage those things in a way where everybody emerges with their dignity and that? I'll, I'll give you a prime example. We, we started talking about like urban scholars, okay? And we bring students of color in as cohorts. And when we first started this, um, one student came into my office, he was irate. He threw his paper down, I got this bad grade because the professor doesn't like my politics. And this was an election year, and I can't remember who was running. But anyways, the student wrote on a Democrat account. And the professor, you know, led to death, right? So I looked at the paper, it was a horrible paper. <laughs> but remember, racialization, right? So you can't just say, look, man, this is a horrible paper. Okay? You sit down with them, point out what's wrong, sit with the professor and say, okay, you were right and great, Nick, but you need to understand, because of this student's life experience, he thinks you gave him a D because of his politics. And you need to sit down with him and you need to tell him that's not true, that's not accurate, and here's why, and here's how I can help you become a better writer. Right? I guarantee you, before urban scholars, that professor never had to deal with something like that. So then the professor goes on a learning journey. Well, why is he thinking that? And you know, then you just you, you, you begin to educate and learn about different perspectives about life and those kinds of things. Yep. Anyone have the last question? One burning question? If you don't ask it in the big group, I'll, I'll, I'll be hanging around here. We're going to continue to talk, but it's, it's 3.30. I thank you for your time. Damien finally has me off the clock. You didn't tell me about this guy, man. <laughs> It's been fun. It's been fun. I appreciate my time. Not in this case. Do you need to come up? No, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to close quickly for word prayer. And then, if you want to talk to me, I got nothing to do but hang out here until I, I'm driving to Springfield. I got a 6 a.m. flight to go home. So I'm hanging out until then. So let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you today for our time at Ozark. I thank you for these wonderful people and, and the heart that they have for God and what they're doing. And I just pray that you just continue to bless the efforts that they're doing here. And, and you would be with the student body. God, and, and I just thank you for the privilege of interacting and fellowship with them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.